The problem is that um, the, the, the lot of the beliefs in veganism being healthy, the healthiest diet, I think that's completely false. I think veganism can be healthier than a standard junk food diet for sure, but it's not by no means is it the choice diet for human beings. You know, even in India where there's a huge vegetarian component, I think most people would concede that veganism is, 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 is a step down. Welcome to another episode of the Totally Wise Indian Podcast. This is the third episode in the diet series. And today we have with us Dr. Sean Baker. For all those people who don't know, who are basically living under the rock and don't know about Dr. Sean Baker, he is the original poster boy, the flag bearer, the advocate, the you know main proponent of the carnivore diet, the meat only diet uh, throughout the world. So you can call him, he, uh, you know, the, the OG carnivore uh, guy in the world. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baker, for joining in and uh, giving us this opportunity. And uh, what better time to have Dr. Sean Baker on the podcast than this month, because this is the World Carnivore Month going on. Uh, it couldn't have been, you know, better. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker, for doing this. Well, Evan and, and Tom, and thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's World Carnivore Month. And just incidentally, I, I actually started World Carnivore Month four years ago just because it's my birthday in January. And I was a little, absolutely, I was a little sort of miffed to the fact that they had a Veganuary Vegan Month. And so I decided let's do World Carnivore Month. And so we've been going in our fourth year and now literally tens of thousands of people have done this and we continue to grow each year and we get to see uh, more and more people quite surprised how good they actually do with with the uh, the meat-based diet yeah we actually had a look at the uh, veganuary and uh, we also knew that your birthday is coming up in a couple days i guess so uh, we wanted to wish you advance happy birthday also Uh, for people who don't know uh, sean baker dr baker is going to turn 54 if i'm not wrong a couple of days yeah very good 54 yeah exactly uh and uh, he doesn't look even 20 eight right now i mean with the kind of shape he is in so i wouldn't want to wish him happy birthday for the 54th age i'll wish him like happy birthday just without the number uh so dr baker uh you know if we would be giving you our introduction it will only it will not be uh it don't it won't serve the justice because we feel that you know you we've gone through your profile and uh and we know what, you know, a lot of things about you and uh, what all you've done, the world records that you have. Uh, it would only be just if you introduce yourself and uh, if you could tell something about yourself, like, you know, right from the beginning, like your basic introduction as to, you know, what, who is Sean Baker for people who don't know? I mean, for people who live under the rock. Yeah, well, I'll try to summarize a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a father of four children. You know, I have, I'm, I have a background as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, spent uh, several decades practicing sort of traditional, you know, Western style medicine. Uh, I've been a lifelong athlete. I've had the uh, fortune to be able to set numerous world records and win world titles in, in various different sports over the years. Uh, I've, you know, been basically training athletically for now over 40 years and still managed to, to still hold myself together without falling apart. So I'm pretty pleased with that. Uh, I, you know, sort of started looking into nutrition about a decade ago for my own personal reasons, as I got a little bit older and that kind of led me on a sort of an interesting journey. And strangely enough, I ended up uh, deciding that a uh, meat-based diet made the most sense for me. And, uh, uh, that apparently inspired some other people to try it. And we started seeing some very interesting things happening. And, uh, you know, this has been, uh, uh, building ever since, you know, I founded a company called meter X with my partner, who's a, uh, entrepreneur, uh, technical uh, person, uh, dad engineer out of Silicon Valley. And so we are uh, growing that business pretty rapidly and, and, you know, using that to, um, basically help people you know, help people get better in, in ways that, uh, that, that a lot of the uh, sort of traditional medical route or traditional dietary routes have, have failed to do. And we're making uh, things happen that, that weren't able to be happening before. 
for people who don't know, uh, Dr. Sean Baker has skipped a lot of things. He is not only, uh, I mean, he doesn't only have a lot of world records. He, uh, if I'm not wrong, a nuclear missile operator. I mean, a former nuclear Long missile jobs. operator. Oh yeah, I forgot. Well. Yeah, I forgot about that. I used to, I used to be in the U.S. I was in the U.S. military on two different occasions. Once initially as a, uh, yeah, nuclear weapons launch officer. So I was in charge of up to 150 nuclear warheads at one time, and then uh, I came back in again as a as a trauma surgeon and was deployed, uh, it, it, you know, during the Afghan uh, war over in Afghanistan. So yeah, I did some of that as well. I forgot. <laughs> Uh, I think he must have also forgotten because uh, he's such a humble soul. <laughs> he must have forgotten that, uh, you know, he's uh, played rugby and uh, he's also played against the Black Caps, if I'm not wrong. And uh, he's rowed. I mean, he. I think you still row? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So when I lived, in, I lived in New Zealand, I got to play high-level rugby, you know, in the Premier League and played, you know, against several of the New Zealand All Blacks who are, you know, the sort of the top level rugby players in the world. And then I, I started some of the rowing later in life and I ended up winning a world championship and setting, uh, I think, three separate world records. And I think I've got six American records in, in that particular sport. So, yeah, I've, I've, I won the Highland Games World Championship. This is where, you know, this is Scottish sport where you wear a kilt and throw heavy objects around. And uh, so I, I did that. And then, of course, I had a background in powerlifting where I'd set a, uh, an American record in the in the deadlift doing uh, 350 kilograms as a, uh, you know, as a drug-free athlete, too. I've always been someone that's never taken, you know, steroids or any of the performance-enhancing drugs. So, yeah. So those are those are some of the, some of the highlights, I guess. I'm pretty sure we're missing a lot of things still, but uh, I think you can proceed. Uh, one small question before we begin, uh, like since we've already wished you advanced uh, birthday, uh, for your birthday, uh, how many years exactly has it been uh, on this meat-only diet for you? Yeah, so I started that back in 2016, sort of full-time. I kind of played with that about a year prior to, kind of off and on. And uh, uh, I, I did like a 30-day experiment i guess the end of 2016 and uh after the 30 days i went one day back on a regular diet and decided that i much preferred the way i felt on a meat-based diet and so uh, i've basically been on ever since so it's been a little over four years so i think four years and two or three months or so now all right so uh let me just take you back uh like like the person you are uh the bigger picture guy uh let me just take you uh just a little bit behind uh could you just tell us or could you just walk our audience through your journey as to, you know, when you wanted to start this uh, diet and uh, what really actually occurred to you and what exactly did prompt you to actually start this carnivore diet or only meat-based diet? What exactly happened before that and what exactly like was your journey like the initial few days? Yeah. So like I said, I've always been an athlete. I've always trained extremely hard and I can, I continue to do so, you know, even, you know, even now in my fifties. And, uh, I think I was about 42 years of age and I noticed that my health was starting to decline despite you know, all the heavy training I was doing. So I decided I had to, uh, you know, adjust diets. Uh, I, I decided, you know, I, I was competing in these very strength dominated sports, which required a lot of size. I was probably weighing at that time, around 130 kilos. So I was a pretty, pretty big fella, you know, I'm, I'm six foot five. And so I think, I think it's about 1.96 meters. I'm, I'm to put it in maybe numbers you guys are more familiar with. And, um, I decided that, you know, I, I needed to, to kind of get a little leaner. And so what I did at that time is I did what I thought was the right thing. And I went on a low fat diet and I exercised multiple times a day and I, and I did manage to lose weight. The problem was I was just pretty miserable. I felt awful. I had no energy. I was tired. I was constantly hungry. I quickly realized that that was not something that would be sustainable for me. And so then I started to uh, change the, the type of foods I was eating. Before I was eating a very veg, almost a vegetarian diet, very uh, vegetable based, fiber based, a little bit of lean meat. Um, you know that was what you know, I was trained to, to believe was, 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 was appropriate. And to be fair, I did lose weight doing that. But again, like I said, it was not something that I felt particularly good at. You know, I, I, I think I had digestive issues. I was, my mood was not particularly nice. The nurses said we much prefer the fat Dr. Baker than the skinny Dr. Baker at the hospital because I was, I was a lot uh, less happy. 
Um, so I started to incorporate more of a paleolithic type of diet, uh, including a lot more animal products in there, felt a little better. Started reading pretty extensively about diet, but some of the popular books, and then started to digging into the primary research. Uh, experimented with myself, kind of went on to a lower carb diet and on a ketogenic style diet for several years. And then as I started you know, hearing about these people that were eating just a, a meat only diet, I thought that was first, I thought it was very bizarre and kind of crazy like everyone does. And then I, as I looked into it more, I said, you know, this is interesting. These people are really seeming to have good results. And I uh, said, well, I'm just going to try it. And so I would do a couple days at a time, you know, I would do two or three days. And I said, that's not so bad. I felt pretty good. I didn't, you know, I was mostly you know, eggs and meat of some type typically. And I would do that for three or four days. And then I'd go back to eating, uh, you know, more, more omnivorous diet. And I noticed what I was noticing is that the days I was just eating the meat and the eggs, I felt better. And then the other days I didn't feel as good. So then I was had to sort of, I, I was like, well, I didn't get sick doing that. So I'm going to do it now. Now instead of two or three days, I'm going to do a week. And so I did a week at a time and once again, felt good. And then I stretched out the two weeks and then finally got out to, you know, uh, a full month of this. And that's where, you know, I was at that point, I was starting to get a little bit of a following on social media. And, you know, mostly it was people that were kind of rowing people and people that were other physicians, low carb people that, you know, I'd kind of sort of made contact with. And we all kind of joked around that I was going to die of a heart attack, or I was going to get scurvy, or, uh, you know, my uh, colon would fall out from the lack of fiber. And of course, none of those things ever happened. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I thought, well, I was going to do it for a month, but then I felt so good. So I continued going. And then as people started to realize that I wasn't just, I was kind of serious about it. You know, there was some criticism, but at the same time, a lot of people became curious about it. Uh, and then we got several hundred people to actually do it. And we did sort of a, uh, sort of an online trial with it, kind of an online sort of N equals money. Many is what we called that a little study back in 2000, early 2017, I believe. And, you know, 100 people did it 90 days. I think the average weight loss was something around 13 or 14 kilos, uh, eight centimeters across the waist, uh, blood pressure improved, uh, uh, heart rate dropped, all these subjective measures of health got better. Uh, we published that online. It caught the attention of uh, so quite a few people. I went on a lot of podcasts. I went on, ended up going on a podcast by a guy named, named Joe Rogan, who you guys may or may not be familiar with there. He's quite popular here in the U.S. and around the world. And that ended up kind of putting me in the spotlight more. And so I've just had a lot of people interested in this up to that point, you know, since that time. Uh Dr. Baker, since you mentioned about scurvy and all, and since Indian community is not very, uh, doesn't have much idea about the meat only diet and carnivore diet, uh, what do you have to say to those people who might watch this episode and say, I mean, uh, vitamin C and other vitamins and other nutrients might be missing with the meat only diet? So, what's your response to them? Well, I mean, the first thing, you know, I, I, I just say is, you know, it's obvious I'm alive and I'm thriving. Anybody who's followed me and, you know, I, I haven't developed scurvy or any really overt or even minimal signs of, of clinical nutritional problems. Um, you know, when we look at different diets, I mean, in a historical context, uh, certainly we've known for maybe 150 years that uh, scurvy was actually prevented or even cured by feeding people fresh meat. So if you have access to fresh food. So what that means is uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, fresh off the animal. It just means it can't be preserved or dried because some of the sailors, you know, these, these quote unquote limeys from the British Navy that were developing scurvy, they were eating dried meats and they were eating a, a very high carbohydrate diet. And so the, that combination does seem to, to, to lead to scurvy and, and basically poor diet quality overall is where we see scurvy in modern times. So we see that in people that tend to have malnutrition issues in a lot of things and people that live on only sort of junk food, they end up getting things like scurvy. And we know that vitamin C requirements uh, seem to be different depending upon what your baseline nutrition level is. We know things like, uh, for instance, uh, there's, a, there's a several transporters in our body across different cellular membranes and mitochondrial membranes where glucose and vitamin C compete with each other. And so if you have a lot of glucose 
either in the digestive tract or in the in the uh, tissues, then vitamin C has a harder time crossing those membranes. So that potentially drives up the requirements for vitamin C. We also know that vitamin C is uh, intimately involved in the uh, 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 the uh, function of carnitine. And so carnitine is something that requires vitamin C. However, a diet that's meat-based provides a lot of carnitine. So you have preformed carnitine that you, again, may not need as much vitamin C. We know that the red blood cells can actually recycle vitamin C in the human. We also know that uh, humans, and, and a few, there's a few other animals that don't produce their own vitamin C. There's, there may be thought that, that the lack of this enzyme called uricase, which breaks down uric acid, uh, is missing in humans or, or deficient in humans. Uric acid actually is an antioxidant. So it, it sort of possibly provides some of the uh, role that vitamin C other would, otherwise would provide. And so most people, the real, they, they associate uric acid with gout, but we also know that uric acid is one of the most powerful anti antioxidants in the body. And so meat will sometimes cause uric acid to rise, even though, even though vitamin C may be slightly lower. Meat, uh, meat does actually have some vitamin C in it, uh, despite the fact that the USDA didn't really test for it. They just assumed it to be none, but the independent labs have shown that there is about 10 milligrams of vitamin C per, say, 500 grams of, 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 of red meat typically. And so that seems to be enough to prevent scurvy at the minimum. Uh, and then we also know, again, when we talk about these um, nutrients that change in requirement based on our diet. And there's those numbers of examples of, for the, with that. And in, in fact, uh, even the USRDA is starting to recognize this, particularly with, with regard to something called zinc. Zinc is one of the minerals we require. And we know that um, the zinc requirements um, are considered to be higher in people that eat a lot of phytic acid. So if you eat a lot of legumes, lots of beans, lots of grains, then you don't absorb as much zinc. So therefore you have to eat twice as much or three times as much zinc, depending on how much phytic acid you're eating. So we're seeing this over and over again. And, and again, this goes back historically. We saw back in the eight, you know, back in the 1800s, 19, early 1900s, uh, studies looking at uh, thiamine, for instance, uh, animals and, and humans that were on a high carbohydrate diet would develop signs of thiamine deficiency. Whereas if they were on a lower carbohydrate diet, they would not, even though they had the same intake of thiamine. So there's there's all kinds of competing uh, nutrients that, to change the profile. A plant-based diet tends to block the absorption of many, many nutrients, many minerals such as zinc and calcium and iron and you know copper and magnesium all are inhibited by uh, things like phytic acid or oxalates or fiber itself. So this this becomes a less efficient type of diet. So when you're eating a plant-based diet, you have to eat more food, more volume, uh, to be able to extract the same amount of nutrition, whereas a meat-based diet, you can eat a lot less and you don't have these quote-unquote anti-nutrients interfering with the absorption. Yeah, just wanted to take you a little a step back actually uh, here. While you were actually, you know, starting off with this idea of meat-only based diet, uh, you as a practicing surgeon, I mean, uh, uh, as a doctor, were you actually, uh, you know, suggesting this to your patients uh, at that time? And uh, I mean, if if so, I mean, were, was there any, you know, backlash or ne uh, negative repercussion uh, of that? Well, so when I was actively practicing as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon, I was at that time starting to recommend uh, not necessarily meat-based diets, but low-carb ketogenic diets. And I was having a lot of success uh, with, you know, people losing weight, certainly, which would help them for surgery. So they didn't go and in, go into surgery, having significant risk factors of being, uh, you know, tremendously overweight, but just as importantly, and something I thought was very interesting is often the joint pain would go away. That is to say, I had people that were going to have surgery for a knee replacement and the pain went away. So, so much that they no longer required the surgery and that piqued my curiosity. And so then I, uh, inquired at the hospital with the hospital administration. I said, hey, I'd like to spend one day a week um, pursuing lifestyle modification to hopefully avoid surgeries. The hospital was not really interested in that because the way the U.S. system works, you know, you get paid and you, you, pay, you pay the bills by doing procedures, so to speak. And so you generate a lot of income for the hospital when you do a lot of surgeries. 
And so they preferred that I do a lot of surgeries rather than talk to people about losing weight and changing their diet. And so they were not at all supportive of that. And so uh, I, you know, decided that, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just start, you know, talking to these patients. And, you know, so we, the hospital and I, we, we came to a disagreement. I ended up leaving the hospital. In fact, I ended up leaving uh, medicine uh, in general uh, and, and went on to just kind of focus on lifestyle-based stuff, which I think to me has been more helpful to more people uh, and has made a bigger impact. And it's, you know, it's been more rewarding to me uh, on a personal level uh, than, than just, doing surgery, which, which is fine. I think the surgery helps a lot of people, but I think what I'm doing now has been uh, uh, many fold more helpful. Uh, so Dr. Wicker, can you tell us about the benefits of a uh, carnivore diet? I mean, as you mentioned right now, uh, when people started to switch from their usual diet to ketogenic diet, they were starting to see some changes and then you moved on to the carnivore diet. So what changes and why do you think those changes occur? So what's your view on that? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, I think we need, I don't think it's controversial to say that nutrition impacts our health. I don't think that's a controversial statement. I think most people would realize that. The question is, what nutrition? And, you know, the sort of the conventional wisdom is, well, eat lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of grains and avoid fat and, and you'll do fine. The problem with that is it's very unlikely that that diet would have been a human diet for most humans during most of the time on earth, depending on how long you think humans have been around. I mean, you know, if, if we look at an evolutionary model, people will say that humans in the form of, you know, homo habilis through homo erectus through homo sapien have been around almost 3 million years. Some, if you, if you were more of a, you know, if the Christian cre creationist model, we say it's maybe four or 5,000 years. And I don't know what the, the prevailing thought is in, in the Indian, uh, you know, religious, different religious cultures, but regardless, humans have always eaten a lot of meat. And the thought that, you know, particularly where I live, in, you know, in, in North America or if, you know, where I'm from, my ancestors are, are Northern European. It would have been very difficult for me or my ancestors to have eaten a diet of 10 fruits and grains, you know, every day, because it would just been impossible. And, and you have to realize that there was, it was, the weather was a lot colder. We were going through ice ages through much of human development. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense that a meat-based diet would have been what's available and what, what has helped us. But what I see as far as benefit goes, you know, certainly a low carbohydrate diet has its, you know, its benefits. I found that the meat-based diet did all of that plus just more it would it would resolve things that, that other issues wouldn't and i think that what we see you know again the modern diet uh, and this is what we're seeing you're seeing this happening in india now where you're having you know greater rates of di diabetes heart disease you're starting to see more obesity as your diet shifts to a more refined processed diet and goes away from a traditional diet of where maybe the ghee is being replaced with uh, some sort of vegetable oil canola oil or soybean oil or palm oil i'm not sure what the oil of choices out there, but that's occurring. We're seeing greater and greater refining of the foods, the sugars, the, the refined grains. And when, when you have highly refined foods, it presents energy to the system much more rapidly than we would normally like. So when I eat, you know, a, a, a piece of meat and whether it's, you know, here I eat beef, but I mean, if you're in India, you could eat lamb or goat or chicken or anything, you know, eggs, that fat and protein is very slowly absorbed and slowly digested. And there's a sequential pattern in which our nutrients are designed to be absorbed. And we have these things called cretin hormones that some are in the very beginning part of the upper digester tract and some are a little bit lower down. But what happens when you eat these ultra processed, super refined foods, it just goes through so quickly that things get sort of stimulated, you know, in, in an incorrect order or with incorrect, uh, uh, incorrect timing. So we get a lot of problems with insulin and glucose, and we get a lot of gut problems where people have this dysbiotic gut where they have the wrong bacteria. And then you put other foods in there and we're, we're not able to tolerate them. So that's why so many people have gastrointestinal problems. It's one of the most common problems in the United States, something like 20% of the people now are diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. I, and I don't know what it's like where you are, but I suspect it's probably similar. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't, maybe they don't have a name for it because people don't put it there. But a lot of people are suffering from bloating and gas and cramping yeah. and, dis and discomfort. We sort of, 
you know, we'll eat a big meal and then our stomach will hurt. And we think that's normal. We're just used to it. So yeah, that's normal. But if I were to walk down the street and my knee really hurt bad, I would think something's wrong. Or if I'd walk down the street and my chest was hurting, I would say, well, there's something wrong. Or if I was walking down the street and breathing hurt me, if every time I took a deep breath, it hurt, we would say, that is wrong. What is wrong with me? Or if I can't see or my eye hurts or I get a headache. But if our guts hurt, we're like, well, that's just normal digestion. Well, I would argue that it's not. And, and what I see on this diet, you don't even notice you're digesting. I mean, you eat, you can eat a big meal, you know, 10 minutes later, I can go run sprints or go or work out, or I don't even feel that I've got food in my, my, my insides, even though it could be, uh, you know, a huge amount. So I think that to me points to maybe, it, maybe an appropriate diet doesn't hurt your stomach or your intestines. Maybe that would, that, that seems like maybe it's a little bit of common sense, but that's what we see. And so, uh, you know, what I see over and over again is people see digestive problems go away. And I think the gut is sort of the entry point for how we, how we interact with the, with the environment. You think about it, most people don't realize this, but our gut is actually external to our body. So that esophagus down into our stomach, into the small and large intestines is all external to our body. We are wrapped around this external space called our gastrointestinal tract. And that is a huge interface of uh, uh, the Im immune system. There's all kinds of immune system components within that gut. And our skin is designed to keep everything out, right? We have this skin that's got a barrier that protects us and keeps it out. But our gut is designed to absorb things, absorb nutrients. The problem is when you're putting the wrong things in there, the wrong things start to get absorbed. And then the gut gets inflamed and irritated. And we get things like leaky gut syndrome where, you know, we start absorbing some of these compounds and problems and bacterial components we're not supposed to absorb. That leads to problems down the road. It could lead to arthritic problems, joint problems, autoimmune issues, allergies, asthma, mental health issues, so on and so forth. And so by fixing the gut through diet, by removing all the bad stuff and then providing a highly bioavailable, highly, uh, you know, valuable nu nutritious component, you know, things just get better and they get better pretty reliably and pretty quickly for most people. Yeah, um, I've heard that uh, the brain basically takes a lot of information from the gut and the gut microbiome is very important. Um, one thing that I heard from Joe Rogan's podcast was uh, one of the guests, he said, uh, one reason probably why carnivore diet or the meat only diet works is because it kind of mimics uh, intermittent fasting because it keeps you, uh, your stomach full and you don't eat so much. Uh, because you're having meat only diet, it keeps you more satiated and you don't, you don't eat, overeat basically. Overeating doesn't happen. And with carbs, overeating happens more. So do you think that's the case? I think that's one of many reasons why it can help people. Yeah, the diet tends to be very satiating. You know, we know that protein is fairly satiating. Fat can be fairly satiating too, depending on how it prepared. Again, I think I, I contrast natural fats, natural animal fats to sort of concentrated industrial fats. You know, some people, dairy fat, you know, like when it comes in the form of ice cream or, you know, really you can overeat that very easily. It's hard to overeat this straight meat. It's, 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 it's not that it's impossible, but it is, it's difficult. Most people have a hard time really eating a lot of that. Um, the, the, the thought that it mimics fasting, um, wh what it can do, and I, I would say that we aren't designed to eat every two hours, even though many people do. I don't think that's how, if we, if we assume that humans at one time were hunters and hunter gatherers, and we were rel relatively nomadic, walking around, following herds of animals that we were eating, it probably would not have been very, very, uh, um, convenient to stop to have to eat every two hours. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, if you're walking in a little group of your, your little tribe and every two hours you're saying, hey, wait, let's go eat something, you wouldn't be very popular because, you know, you think you, you know, if you were cooking, you'd have to start a fire. So probably they probably they ate once or twice a day would be my guess. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but that, that would make sense. And I think that's kind of how we're designed. And we see that, uh, um, you know, one of the things that occurs when you're eating very frequently, and you do make out the point out with carbohydrates, it is easier to eat carbohydrates to excess, particularly when they're highly processed. There's some good studies out there that show that people, when they're faced with highly processed or ultra processed foods, 
they just eat more. They just eat more calories and calories do matter. You know, however, this diet impacts that. I think one is, yes, you probably are more satiated. You might eat a little less, you might eat a a little less frequently. The other thing is protein does seem to have an advantage metabolically. We know that a higher protein diet, much of that protein, about 25% of the protein that you consume is utilized, uh, is is burned itself just to digest it. So 25% of the protein you eat doesn't turn into calories. You know, it's kind of like free calories, more or less. You can kind of think of it that way. Uh, That doesn't happen to that extent with fat and carbohydrates. That's that's more like 5%, maybe 10%. So you get a big advantage by eating a meat-based diet. Most people... Uh, in, in, and I don't know what the situation in India, but I, I suspect it's a similar, or even, if not worse. In the United States, protein is only about 12 to 15 percent of the of the U.S. diet. To me, that's not enough protein. Now there are people out there that are saying pro- too much protein is bad, and so on and so forth hurts your kidneys. Again, that information is completely based on studies that have long been disproven. You know, there's this this notion about protein harming our kidneys was based on some rat studies done by a guy named Dr. Brenner back in the 1980s. That was his hypothesis. Rats are not human beings. We've seen over and over again that humans on higher protein diets do not see compromise of their kidney function, doesn't harm their, doesn't harm their liver, doesn't make them age more rapidly. In fact, what we see is particularly older people that don't get enough protein, they become frail, they become sarcopenic, they break their bed, they break their hips, they become less functional and their life quality of life goes down rapidly. So it's incredibly important to eat adequate protein to preserve lean muscle mass, to preserve function, particularly as you get older. You know, like I said, I'm, you know, midway through my fifties right now, and I'm trying to hang on every last muscle that I can. And I think that's very important to do that. And I think that's something that, uh, uh, you know, you appreciate it when you lose it and no one wants to be in that situation, uh, to lose that. So I think, uh, um, you know, the, there's, there's no human research and no credible human research that says you should limit protein significantly to where some people will recommend. I think that's based on some animal studies, some epidemiologic studies, which aren't particularly helpful, and then really no valid human data. Uh, Dr. Baker, uh, since, I mean, you, you spoke about our ancestors and, you know, so it's, uh, it's easy to understand from that because when we were hunter gatherers, uh, we cannot, uh, it, we were in groups and we used to go and hunt. So it was not possible for us to eat every two hours and every three hours. So we predominantly uh, based our diet on, you know, meat because it would give us energy for the longer period. And then, and so that is why uh, probably we evolved to have more eat, uh, eat more meat, basically meat based diet. But uh, in, in the modern society, uh, because we have carbs and carb based uh, diets and all processed uh, processed food, it's much more. Uh, we are more addicted to have it because uh, back then in our uh, back then our an- ancestors didn't have access to so much for food. So our, our physiology basically evolved to crave for more carbohydrates, and that's one of the reasons why we have rise in obesity and all of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting, and many people don't realize this, that somewhere between 100,000 and maybe 25,000 years ago, there was a dramatic reduction in the size of the human brain. We lost about 200 cc's of brain. And we went from, you know, if we, if we again, if we pursue this evolutionary model, we went from a, you know, an early human, uh, you know, Australopithecus with about a 300 cc brain, all the way up to the largest human brains that have ever been recorded were the Neanderthals at 700 C, 1700 cc's. And the Neanderthals were mostly carnivorous. It's pretty clear from, from, from radioisotopic data that they ate almost an exclusively meat-based diet. Some of the early humans around them also were heavily involved in eating a lot of meat. And once we sort of um, lost some access to those big animals, these big mega herbivores, the mastodons, the mammoths, the elephants, we would eat those pretty regularly. Once those died off to the, to the level where they weren't available to us, we had to start hunting smaller, leaner animals. We didn't have as much fat. Um, we didn't have as much you know, readily ready access to foods. We had to rely more on plants, processing plants. Eventually around 10, 12,000 years ago, we learned to cultivate and process grain. 
And because of the grain processing, we were able to grow dramatically from a civilization standpoint. We were able to support these massive populations. The problem is the populations, the individuals in those populations were smaller, were weaker. They had problems. They, their brain shrunk 200 cc's. Their muscle mass went down. They didn't grow as tall. You know, they had nutritional problems. And then we started having the feasts and the famines. And so the fam when the crops fails, you had famines. And so that was you know, again, what allowed the, the growth of civilization, and there's a lot of, lot of wonderful things that occurred due to civilization, it led to decreases in overall individual health. And we can, you know, you can see that in population height is a good proxy. And we there's something called stunting, where when you see these populations where the children don't have access to, you know, a full complement of nutrition, they become shorter, they, they, they don't develop as well, you know, they, they, they don't develop as well mentally, physically, uh, their height tends to be smaller. Uh, and so if we look at like some of the historical populations, like, you know, places like the Mayans uh, or some of these, you know, other populations where the average height of a man was you know, not just under five feet tall. And you, we compare that to like the Gravedians who lived about 30,000 years ago in Central Europe. And they they were specialized mammoth hunters. These guys, average height was six foot two. That's taller than the tallest living population in the world today. The tallest people today the height is around six foot one. And that's places like the Netherlands or Croatia, where you have males that are, you know, six foot one is the average, but you have males that are six foot eight, six foot nine, six foot 10, pretty regularly. Uh, so we have Gravedians living 30,000 years ago that were even taller and stronger and physically more robust because they had constant supply and access over generations to these super, you know, high quality nutrient rich diets. I'm trying to remember exactly where I cut off at, but I, I think we were talking about uh, this grain-based populations and, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the individual suffered, even though the group expanded. So it's one of those, it's kind of like the greater good, but everybody had to, to take a hit individually. And I think it's really, now you think about this, this sort of carnivore diet that we're doing here, you know, I'm in the United States, meat is a lot easier to come by than it might be where you are. Yeah. Uh, particularly beef and things like that, which is prohibited in, in many parts of India, as I understand. But the diet that I'm able to eat today is probably in line with a more normal human diet in the, in the, in the uh, you know, context of what humans have eaten throughout, its, throughout their existence. Um, this is a modern, this is only available due to, to what we've been able to accomplish modern with modern agriculture. And there's some problems with that. You know, a lot of people don't like the way we farm both for crops and for animals. And so there's definitely problems with that. Um, but, you know, previously, you know, a cow you would have never eaten or an, a beast of burden you would have never eaten because they're working animals they are pulling the plows there, you know. And so even in countries where, you know, there wasn't a prohibition to, from eating meat or beef or cows, they wouldn't eat them very much because they were, they, they were, they were working animals. And, you know, my understanding, you know, if you look at, you know, in the Indus Valley where, you know, India is part of the Indus Valley, right. There was a recent study coming out showing, looking at some of the pottery from three or 4,000 years ago, and it was full of animal fat. You know, they know that they were eating, you know, prior to the adoption of vegetarianism as part of the religion there, India, you know, that part of the world was very much animal based. And so there was been, a, obviously it's been a change based on, uh, uh, you know, different religions, but, uh, uh, but now, you know, we've, we've been sort of only the wealthy could have eaten, you know, a lot of meat, you know, it's been safe for, you know, we can look at, you know, European literature where the, the royalty was eating the meat and the sort of the peasants would be given the scraps, you know, the vegetables, the roots, you know, maybe they'll get a, maybe they'll get a piece of organ meat once in a while, if somebody feels nice to them, but, uh, so it's only recent times that we can kind of sort of approximate what we might have had access to hundreds of thousands of years ago. And, and I think, I, you know, just from the way I see people adopt to this, you know, when you, when you, so if we were to take an animal, like any animal, like a zebra, and try to determine what he was going to eat, we wouldn't go to the supermarket to shop for the zebra and say, oh, what's in the supermarket that we can give the zebra? We would look at what the zebra was eating out in the wild and we'd say, that's what zebras eat. The problem is with humans, we, we, we've not done that, you know, because now humans are eating whatever's in the grocery store <laughs> and we're just kind of like, well, that's what humans do. Well, and, and it's fair that we can adapt to a lot of things. We're able to eat a lot of different types of food. We're definitely 
uh, even though I could promote something called a carnivore diet, I don't think humans are strict carnivores. I think we are opportunistic omnivores. I think we are probably something called a facultative carnivore, which means we do really good on meat. That's our preferred fuel, but we have the capacity to do these other things. If you look at a comparative anatomy um, and you look at you know the, the hardware we have, that is, you know, how much stomach do we have, how much small intestine, how much large intestine do we have? And we look at it in terms of fermentation capacity, because how a chimpanzee or a gorilla gets its energy is from a high fiber diet, which they then convert that fiber through their gut microbiome into short chain fatty acids. And so they're actually eating relatively high, they're actually absorbing a relatively high fat diet, even though they're eating a high fiber, low fat, low fat diet. We lost most of that fermentative capacity. You know, a chimpanzee or gorilla may have up to 60% of its uh, digestive system dedicated to fermentation. Humans only have around 15 to 18% of our gut is, is dedicated to fermentation. That is very similar to uh, both a cat and a dog. A cat and a dog are right in the same meal. So we should probably eat a diet similar to a cat or a dog. Cats, most people would concede are, are obligate carnivores. Dogs, and they descended from wolves for people that don't know that dogs came from wolves and wolves generally eat a pretty carnivorous diet. And so that, and, and the reason sort of, I think we sort of, you know, a lot of people call dogs man's best friend. We sort of co-evolved with them after a period of time. We domesticated the dog because the dog had a very similar eating pattern to what we had. And perhaps we gave them our scraps and, and they helped us hunt. And, and that's kind of how that theory goes. But, uh, um, it's pretty clear that we are uh, physiologically well adapted to meat. You know, we have this acidic, very acidic stomach acid. We have some, some of the most uh, acidic stomachs of all the animals in the world. You know, our, our stomach acid routinely sits at about a pH of 1.5, which is extremely, extremely acidic. Uh, other animals that have that are things like vultures, hyenas, these animals that are scavengers. And the reason for that, one, it's very metabolically expensive to have such a, such a very strongly acidic stomach environment. And why would we invest all that energy in producing a really acidic stomach? Well, it's thought that maybe early humans started out scavenging, scavenging leftover meat they found from animals that, that had killed, you know, like a big lion had killed killed a zebra and now we went behind and kind of picked up the scraps and so we had been exposed to a lot of bacteria uh things that could have gotten us sick and so that big you know really powerful low ph high acidic stomach environment was able to kill those microorganisms and so the humans that developed the, the really acidic stomach and could eat that food were able to thrive and continue to grow and, and grow that bigger brain and as we had better and better access to you know, higher quality nutrition, animal fat, high, high, high nutrient density, less chewing, you know, for instance, a gorilla, who like a lot of people like to compare humans to, to different apes, a gorilla will spend about 80% of its day chewing. I mean, all day it just chews, it chews and chews, and it eats something like 40 or 50 pounds of food or 25 kilos of food a day, you know, something like that. And, you know, humans, you know, based on jaw structure, it's estimated that we spend about 4% of our time chewing. So instead of 85% of the time chewing, we only spent 4% of our waking hours chewing, which would indicate we found a very, very nutrient dense, rich source of calories. And the only thing available out there is basically animal fat. And so that, so as we started to access this animal fat more regularly, our brain started to grow a little bigger. We got you know, as, as, as our brain, brain go, grew bigger, we started to learn how to hunt more effectively, how to communicate with each other, how to develop strategies. And then by the time Homo erectus was, was sort of on its way about 1.8 million years ago, they mastered how to kill big animals with just a spear technology. And so they were taking down these giant animals with the spears, eating as much as they want. They had constant supply of food, brain got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually we got to, you know, Homo sapien, Neanderthal, and here we are today. And as many, many people don't know, we are kind of a mixture of both Homo sapien and Neanderthal and probably some other of uh, these variants, Homo uh, uh, Denisovians and, and some of the other uh, sort of mixtures that are out there. So we're all kind of hybrids. There's a very interesting study since you mentioned about uh, the diet and the, uh, our teeth structure and everything. There's a very interesting study which says uh, the more we go into processed foods, 
uh, there's a likely chance that our teeth and our jaw structure might change and people might have you know not a well formed teeth and you know crossing here so that's there um i would like to know about um, your diet so how does your daily diet look like what, what well, do you well right right now during world carnivore month it's very simple it looks like uh two meals a day uh about a kilo of red meat in the morning and a kilo of red meat later in the day and that's it a little salt and some water that's uh, that's I, i'm do i do that for world carnivore month you know just to kind of that's my baseline and honestly i feel the best when i just do that now throughout the year i'll eat a little more eggs i'll have a little bit of dairy i'll eat a little maybe some seafood i'll eat some different cuts of meat maybe i'll have some pork um you know that's you know, I, i'll put spices on the food I, i'm not opposed to any of that stuff you know in fact when my child has a birthday i've had a birthday piece of cake you know and, and it's got everything who knows what's in that and i don't i just do that to not that i really want it but i do do that to kind of make the kid happy and i think one the last time i had it i was fine the one before that i get made me pretty sick i was just like i'm not used to this all the sugar and you know stuff that's in there and it's, my body didn't like it very well but, but i mean generally um i eat twice a day that's pretty routine I, again we talked about this um intermittent fasting or this not eating every 2 hours i just don't have much hunger um most of the day now i eat a lot i mean i i'm a big guy i'm you know like i said right now i'm 6 foot 5 about 250 pounds so i'm about 100 what is it 130 kilos no no not 130 115 kilos something 112 kilos 113 kilos something like that and so i probably eat about 2 kilos of meat a day you know which is which is a lot you know and like i said i don't i i eat more than most people but i train very hard you know i'm still interested in competing athletically and uh uh so that's uh you know kind of what i do um i don't drink much other than water you know very rarely i'll have a maybe a glass of wine in my my better half my girlfriend is from from france and she still likes to have a glass of wine in fact she started out as a vegetarian when i met her about 8 years ago and since that time she was having stomach problems and she's slowly transitioning now she is about 95% carnivore and feeling the best she's ever felt in her life. Some it's fine and it's it's kind of funny. She's just uh got great energy and uh, it's 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 really made a big difference in her life as well. That's actually uh one thing that I wanted to ask actually. Uh I mean uh do your family also actually uh like uh have a completely meat based diet or like a carnivore diet especially the kids i mean are they yeah so my like i said my 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 girlfriend is about 95% and some days she's 100% you know she'll she'll sometimes have a little bit of fruit or sometimes a little bit of vegetable but that's about it you know she'll have some you know some dairy some yogurt um my kids probably every meal they will have it will be meat based they will have you know some kind of meat some kind of egg some kind of dairy um every meal that's and and they will have typically if they're still hungry they'll have some fruit uh they might have a little bit of dairy with that rarely do they ask for or want vegetables we don't force it on them uh if they want some they can have it but they almost never want it um once in a while they'll have you know a, you know a treat or something like that but mostly it's you know i i just and they like it. I don't have to push hard. I just say, "Hey, make sure you eat enough meat to get the nutrition." I I think if we look at it like this, if we just realize that meat is a crucial critical part of the diet. Now, this is an interesting thing. Most people think, you know, meat is fat, it's protein, there's some vitamins in there, B vitamins, there's some iron and so on and so forth. But meat, beef actually or really any meat, lamb is going to be the same way. According to to something called nutriomics, which is a study of the individual nutrients in all these foods, um has something like 50,000 individual compounds you know most of which we have no idea what they do i mean it's just it's just so unique you know there's 50,000 that have been identified so far there's probably even more than that and the problem with that is you know we there's a there's a nice study that a guy named Stefan Van Vliet Van Vliet rather at a Duke University did uh, and i interviewed him a couple weeks ago but they they compared standard meat beef in this case to the plant based burgers you know the fake fake meat burgers that are being i'm sure they're they're making their way to india but beyond meat impossible burgers so on and so forth and they compared them 
And only 10% of the nutrients found in, in actual beef were in these plant-based analogs. So 90% was missing. And even though same amount of protein, same amount of, uh, you know, carbohydrates and fat, you know, and it may even taste similar. It's nowhere close. It's not even in the same planet. I mean, it's just in a different, different solar system completely. So to pretend that you can get what you can get from animal products um, is just, is just crazy. And these people that are saying, we're going to get the world to, to, to leave animal products because we can make it taste just as good. It may taste the same and you may, they very well may be able to make it taste very similar. And, you know, but the problem is you're going to be missing out with all these nutrients and, you know, particularly with children, for instance, we're seeing things like choline becoming more and more important. I mean, we know about B12 and we know about zinc and we know about some of these other compounds that have been around, but we're discovering more compounds every year or two. They're like, wait a minute, if we don't have that, we don't develop as well. And so, you know, as a parent, and this is what I, I, I I'm very I don't care what an adult eats. You can eat whatever you want. It's up to you. you. If you're a big boy, you make that decision. But when you start telling, you know, when you start making the kids and you start them out behind, you know, the curve and then you, you force an ideology on them and they end up, maybe they could have been three inches taller. Maybe they could have had five more IQ points that you've kind of, you know, kind of limited them. And I think that's, that's unfair to the children. So, you know, we see that in countries that are suffering from malnourished, the most effective way to improve the status of, of, of a poor person is to provide some sort of animal product, whether it's eggs, whether it's milk, whether it's chicken, whether it's, you know, some, some other animal meat that is going to have the biggest impact of anything you can do nutritionally for these folks. Yeah. I think, uh, I think this will be the right time to actually bring in this question. Uh, uh, what does uh, like Sean Baker have to say about, veganism like what do you have to say about veganism or the concept of veganism yeah so that's very good that you you make the point that it's a concept because it it you know and, and a lot of vegans are they'll they'll very they're very defensive about this they say it's not a diet it is a lifestyle choice it is a decision i almost consider it to be almost a religious sort of thing um the problem is that um the the, the lot of the beliefs in veganism being healthy, the healthiest diet, I think that's completely false. I think veganism can be healthier than a standard junk food diet for sure, but it's not by no means is it the choice diet for human beings. You know, even in India where there's a huge vegetarian component, I think most people would concede that veganism is, 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 is a step down, you know, as far as nutrition is concerned. Um, I think the, the, the belief that, you know, you're going to save an animal's life I think that's fine. I think that's, that, that, I don't think there's any wrong with that. I think it'd be no, but I, but I, but you have to understand that in food production, particularly modern food production, many, many animals are killed. I mean, you know, just to harvest crops. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of little animals that get either poisoned and it's not, you know, they, they say it's unintentional, but I say you, you, there's a word called pesticide and pesticides are sprayed on crops. The very word pesticide means you're planning on killing pests. This is an intentional act. So we are killing bugs. We're killing insects. We're killing mice. We're killing rabbits. We're killing foxes. We're killing deer. We're killing, uh, you know, wild pigs. We're killing all of these animals that would otherwise inhabit that area. And to grow these crops, you have to decimate everything. There can't be a weed there. You have to kill everything except for the one crop that you want to grow. And when you do that, you destroy the, ha the habitat for all these wild animals. And so these animals all end up being either dead or their quality of life or injured or harmed in some way, regardless. So the belief that veganism is going to spare animals' lives is, is, is kind of, it's, it's truly misguided. Um, the, and so I can make the argument that if I wanted to eat in a way to where I would create the, le the least animal suffering, then I would eat a carnivore diet and I would focus on an animal that is raised in a, what we call a regenerative fashion or holistic fashion where the cow eats grass or the, the lamb eats grass and, you know, it, it, there's no pesticides or herbicides. And then when the animal, animal is old enough, it's slaughtered, you eat it. And you only have to eat, you know, a, a few animals. You know, if I'm eating a big animal, I only need to eat one or two of them. If I'm eating smaller animals, I might have to eat, you know, 10 of them, you know, to feed myself, 10 lambs, to, to, you know, 10 sheep to feed myself for a year, maybe. That's far better than the thousands and thousands of animals that go into 
typical crop production. So I think the ethical organs are misguided. I think most people don't realize that people, and I know there has been some unrest among the farmers and ranchers in India uh, recently. I've seen a lot of protests you know, about something. I'm not sure all the details on that, but though I think those people will tell you that they do not do that because they, they hate animals. They, they're not going in this because they, most of them really like the animals. They try to take care of them. They know that those animals, the, the, the well-being of those animals is what helps to keep them healthy, you know, because they've got to have, if they have sick animals, it doesn't do them any good. You know, it, 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 it decreases their ability to make a living. So they, there's a, there's a motivation to keep their animals healthy and happy and well. And uh, that, that's certainly the case where I'm at. I know I've, I've talked to ranchers all the time and they're, they're, you know, they're definitely sort of horrified when they hear this, you know, some rancher was beating its animals and, and not doing the right thing. And that's not, that's not the norm. The problem is the vegans take these abnormal examples and they pretend this is how it is everywhere. And all people do this and all farmers and ranchers are evil people. And their only goal is to torture and mistreat animals when nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, now, ultimately, these animals die for our food. There's no doubt about that, you know, whether it's a chicken or a, a fish or, you know, a, a scallop or something. And, you know, what really sort of is interesting to me is, you know, even if you, when the vegans say, I'm not even going to eat a scallop, you know, a mollusk, uh, it, it, it makes really little sense to me because it's like they're not particularly, you know, they, they could care less. They, I don't think they have any concept of, I don't think they have any concept of what it means to be alive. Maybe they do. Um, and then the other thing is the environmental aspect of it. And I think this is, you know, and I, I certainly can speak better to what I know about the U S I know um, when we look at greenhouse gases, for instance, in the United States, our animal agriculture is responsible for about 4% of the, the greenhouse gases in the United States. The transportation sector is about 28%. The energy sector is about 29%. The, ener the energy sector is another, I think, the, in the industry sector is about 30%. So the cows only produce about 2% of the animal agriculture or the, the methane or, the, or not the methane, the greenhouse gases in the United States. So it's really a smaller issue than we're told to believe. And the other thing is, you know, if we want to look at a solution, a long-term solution to solve climate change, if, if, if that's what you're concerned about, animals can certainly be part of that solution. And one of the things we see, and I will, I will, will kind of point to India a little bit because you have a lot of cows in India. You know, I mean, I don't know if you know that, but you've got like 200 million cows in India. You've got one of the biggest herds in the world, more than we have in the United States. The problem is a lot of those cows tend to not be the healthiest cows because they're wandering around, they're eating whatever they want to eat and they get a lot of parasites. And even when you milk them, it takes you, it takes a lot more time to get the same amount of milk that we can get out of a, a, a cow in the United States. And some of it has to do with genetics, breeding of the animals, proper nutrition, proper care, uh, timing, how the animals give birth to their, to their, to their next, you know, their, their calves. And so just by increasing the efficiency uh, by focusing on restoring the soil, you know, if you have people that will do that and, and rotate the animals correctly, you can offset carbon emissions completely. Like in the United States, it's estimated that if we can take 50% of our cattle and manage them in a holistic manner, you know, we could offset all of the greenhouse gases that the United States produces, including the transportation sector, the energy sector, just by getting cows on grass and rotating them correctly and, and put, depositing soil. That's what the data shows that we could do if, if the will were there. So instead of saying we're all going to go vegan, in the United States, this is an interesting fact. I, I, again, I'll use U.S. data. Um, in the United States, if every American, 330 million of us, stopped eating meat and animals today, and we also got rid of all those animals, we magically took them off the earth and made them all disappear, the impact worldwide on global greenhouse gases would be less than 1%. It would be something like 0.36%. That's, that's how much difference you'd make. That would be every American in the, in the world, dis, you know, stop eating meat and then all the animals, all the, all the horses, all the cows, all the pigs, all the sheep, all the chickens, all the cats and all the dogs were gone. Just completely like somebody like uh, Thanos from uh, the Avengers snapped his finger and made them all go away, right? 100%. It would only it wouldn't even make one percent difference. So why are we why are we trying to pursue that? Well, I'll tell you why we're trying to pursue that is because there are some very wealthy people, Silicon Valley and other places that are invested 
in feeding you cheap food. We know these grain products are extremely cheap. They're highly, highly profitable. And therefore, if we, if we tell everybody it's good for you to eat, it's going to save the environment. That's not the, that's not the truth. It's just what you'll believe. And we'll make a lot of money on that. So that's where this all comes down to. And so it's really not veganism. They've been co-opted. Really what's happened recently is the vegans have been around since 19, the 1940s. It's the vegan movement started in the 1940s back in the UK. They've been sort of kind of kind of ignored and, and kind of just thought they're these kind of weirdos, leave them alone. They're kind of hippies and crazy people. But recently people have decided to say, hey, we can make a lot of money on this. If we can get people to give up meat, even if it's only 10% of the meat that they're eating, we can make billions and billions of dollars. And so that's what they're seeing. They're seeing this market, which projected to grow to $150 billion a year uh, within the next five years or so. So they're advertising it, they're marketing it, they're trying to guilt you into it. You know, it goes against your common sense, you know, I mean, well, mine anyway. I mean, I know what when I eat it, I feel better. It's it's part of the human experience. It's part of who we are. Yes, it's part of that cycle of life. I wish, you know, maybe more vegans watch The Lion King so they could say, hey, look, <laughs> if you're going to watch a Disney film, at least watch The Lion King so you can get an idea that, yes, animals do die every day. It's part of life. You will, too, eventually die. The worms will eat you. The microbes will eat you. We all feed back into this 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 cycle. And I don't know how that jives with, you know, Hinduism or any of those things, but I know that you know, there's reincarnation, but ultimately we all participate and death is part of life and life is part of death. And you just have to be able to accept that. And, and, you know, I think you can do, you can do the best you can to ensure those animals are treated well. And then when it's time for their sacrifice, then that's fine. They, they, most of the animals in the United States, they have a great life and then they have one bad day. You know, and, and, and it's usually over in a few seconds. And if you compare that, like with wild animals, you know, like we look at a ruminant animal, there is a population in, in the U.S., the white-tailed deer population. Studies on that have been done. Uh, University of Pennsylvania did a study looking at white-tailed deer, and they found that of the small, you know, the deer that when they're just born, if they follow them for a year, 50% do not even make it to 12 weeks. Most of them are eaten alive brutally by a predator, whether it's a wolf or a bear or some other animal that will rip those animals to par apart while they're alive and eat them while they're alive, or they'll freeze to death or they'll starve to death. You know, and you compare that to a, to say a domesticated lamb or cow in the United States, 99% of those animals make it to adulthood. They're fed every day, they're watered, they're protected from predators. They have a pretty good life. You know, I, I think the, the vegans that say, I speak for the cows or I speak for the pigs or I speak for the sheep. If you were to ask the sheep, would you rather be ripped apart as an infant and eaten alive? Or would you rather live a couple of years in, you know, and, and be, be fed and watered every day and taken care of? What would you choose? I, I you know, I think most of them would say, well, you know, <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather live a little bit longer, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, one other thing that I wanted to, since you've spoken about the processed foods and all, uh, the more we eat, it kind of uh, helps the uh, the health industry also because it makes you sick. And this this could all be a cons conspiracy probably, or it, it's a very interestingly put uh, economic you know uh, system. Uh, having said that. Uh, you even spoke about uh, impossible burgers and uh, these plant-based meats. Uh, the one thing that very uh, shocks me very much is because the primary focus of these companies is to make it, make these uh, plant-based meats taste like actual meat. But and and the focus is not the nutrition. But when we talk about diet, when we talk about food, the first focus should always be the nutrition, what you get out of it, not the taste. Why we are so focused on the taste? Well, because that's what sells. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the food industry, you know, they have this thing called the bliss points. You know, Moskowitz back in the 19, I think 70s came up with that concept. We know what people will eat. If it tastes good, it doesn't have to be nutritious. It's, we just want to keep, it's, it's, we want it to be a, have a drug-like effect where we have to keep eating it over and over again. Nutrition is, is incidental. It's a secondary concern. Human health has nothing to do with why food companies produce food that they produce. It is all about profit. It is all about 
repeat sales. It is all about shelf life stability. You know, if you, if you sell food that's, you know, that, that's got to be refrigerated like meat and, and can only sit on the shelves for a couple of weeks, it's hard to make a, long, a, a big profit on that. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where they want to make food that, you know, is going to last. It can sit on the shelf for three years if it needs to. It's very, very tasty. You know, I mean, yeah, the processed food tastes wonderful. It's great. The problem is, you know, you eat it and you're like, well, I'm still hungry. So I'm going to eat some more until you get enough. You finally eat so much that your, your stomach hurts, but you don't get the nutrition you need. And that is part of the problem. So it drives, again, I talked about these ultra processed food studies. It drives you to eat more and more until you reach a level of nutrient sufficiency. And it may take you three times as much food. Um, you know, there's, there's something called the protein leverage hypothesis where people talk about if I will eat until I get enough protein, and if you're eating a carbohydrate based food, you know, if you're eating a bunch of, you know, rice or, or let's say potato chips or something like you're going to eat those over and over and over again, because you're not getting much protein with that. So you're going to overeat calories. Uh, and then you're going to overeat a lot of the chemicals that go with that, you know, in many cases in the processed food, and that's clearly harmful. And I think what we see again is the gut is damaged by this long term. And so we have this dysbiotic gut, this dysfunctional gut. And then we don't even tolerate the foods we're designed to eat, which may be meat. They may be some of the, the whole foods, even fruits and vegetables that we you know, can eat. But now we have problems with those. And so now our guts hurt no matter what we eat. Yeah. I actually want to, uh, I mean, there was an interesting question. I mean, there was an interesting uh, point that you actually, uh, you know, were saying. Because, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, the early human beings, uh, we used to be hunters and gatherers and uh, it didn't make any sense. I mean, of course, common sense would uh, tell us that, you know, we couldn't be eating every two hours. So, but now the uh, society here, I mean, especially here in India, uh, think that it's more healthy to actually eat every two hours. That's a general notion that uh, kind of, you can say a trend that has come here in India that, you know, every two hours, every two and a half hours, if you keep eating, that's more healthy for you. And, uh, you know, that's something, uh, I don't know if that's uh, the trend is uh, there in USA right now, but uh, it's certainly here in India. Like if you eat every two hours, it's good. If you have five to six meals in a day, that's good. Uh, you know, it keeps filling you and it keeps, you know, uh, it's a balanced way to uh, keep your body running. That's, I mean, what do you have to say about that? Well, I mean, certainly in that concept is, is definitely there. There are many nutritionists and dietitians that are supportive of that, even among diabetics, which I think is just, just kind of cr almost criminal to, to do that. But um, so when you are running on a carbohydrate based metabolism, what you do see is you see that our glucose is very unstable. So it'll go up after we eat a carbohydrate based meal and then it'll plummet and it'll go below baseline because the insulin is secreted. And then we have this constantly up and down with hunger. So what they think is instead of having that hunger, you're going to eat constantly. So your blood glucose is always kind of a little bit high. And that has, you know, effects down the road, you end up eating more food overall, you gain weight long term that way, or many people do. Um, so I think that is, you know, based on so we're making these corrections based on the fact that we're eating the wrong diet. So we're trying to, we're trying to put together a diet that humans aren't suited to eat. And, and, and it, it becomes difficult. We have to make all these contortions and, you know, supplements and balancing and all these things to do um, because we're eating the wrong diet. You know, it's like, it's like trying to watch, a, you know, if you had a, a lion and you were feeding him, you know, broccoli and cabbage and, and you're trying to make, well, how much broccoli and cabbage does this lion eat? Well, this lion must be need be eating every two hours because he's clearly not doing well. Keep feeding him the, the wrong food, Right because he's, he's just not, he's hungry all the time. And, and well, just, just shove something in there. I think that's what we're kind of seeing, you know, because people don't feel good. If they're on a carbohydrate diet and they don't eat every few hours, they really, they don't, they get sleepy, they fall asleep, they become, you know, they get, they, their brain can't think, uh, they're, they're starving, they're mad, their, their moods are up and down. So uh, that I think is what's going on. And so if you, if you drop, you know, like I said, the, the carbohydrates out of the diet rely on fat and protein and meat. It's, it's, it's kind of smooth. Everything's kind of leveled out. Your energy levels are stable. Your, your hunger level is, is minimal. Um, you know, I can go, I can go 24 hours without eating no problem at all. I mean, in fact, I usually go 
pretty much every day I go somewhere between 14 and 18 hours with, 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 between my last meal and my first meal today. I, it's it's 7.15 in the evening here. I had my lunch, my last meal today was around 1 p.m. I'll eat again tomorrow at eight. So that's something like, what is that? Five, some, that's like 19 hours of no food. And I'm totally fine. And, you know, I'm, I'm having this conversation with you guys. I'm not hungry. I'm not falling asleep. I'm not, you know, I'm not angry. You know, that that's that's the difference between, you know, how we're supposed to be and how we're trying to adapt to this diet that we're maladapted to. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that's just an attempt to do this. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, and, and I think that's, you're trying to do the best you can. But I mean, if you just fix the diet from the beginning, you won't need to do that. Uh, Dr. Baker, now can we talk about meat addicts and are there any Indians in the meat addicts community? And Yes, there are. We have, we have some, we have, a, we have a fellow, his name is BNS and I, I don't remember part he's from India and he's got like, I think he's got now a hundred thousand YouTube followers here in India, which is, I guess, quite, is pretty good. He just started that. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of people in India. You've got 1.3 billion in there. So there's a big country. Uh, but yes, we do have some, we do have a number of folks from India uh, in the, in the, in the community, you know, I think that despite the fact that India is known as a vegetarian country, I think there is a huge opportunity for a carnivore type diet to help a lot of people there. And you can do it, you know, in that concept, you can use lamb and goat and you can use chicken and you can use, use eggs and dairy and you can kind of, you know, build a pretty good diet that way, seafood, depending if you're on the coast and so on and so forth. So, uh, yes, there are there are members of the Indian community at Meter X. We are an international community. We have people from all over the world, uh, almost, well, I can't say every country, but certainly countries that I know at least speak some level of English, you know, because we have, uh, you know, quite a few from South America, you know, and then obviously India has a, a pretty robust English speaking population. Uh, but yeah, we are, we are excited. We've got coaches from around the world. I, I, I I wonder if BNS, I can't remember if he's doing coaching for us or not, but we have uh, people from all over the world that are doing coaching. We have, we just rolled out our instant coaching. So you can call any time of the day and just get a coach right then instantly. If you've got questions to help you kind of, you know, adapt to the diet, or if you have a particular concern or you need some support, because some people just, something happens, they need support. It's like having a friend on speed dial and type of stuff. So we, uh, we're doing that. The meter X, uh, community, you know, we are a huge resource um, for uh, everything you'd want to know about this diet, this lifestyle. We have thousands of, of uh, uh, research articles that we've collected that support what we're doing. We uh, have physicians that are members that if people need a physician to help them, you know, uh, you know, act in the role of physician that's going to support them. We have uh, recipes. We have, you know, meetings every single day. I, I host a meeting seven days a week, 365 days a year. I am fully available to all the members. They want, they just want to come in and chat and ask me questions. You know, I'll either, I'll either be interviewing somebody as part of a podcast and the members are in there asking their questions to the podcast guest, or I just answer questions directly, or I'll, you know, I'll present some kind of topic of the day and, you know, maybe I'll pull up a study and we'll discuss the study and, you know, I'm there always to answer the questions for the folks and we just kind of support each other. So it's been a really um, rewarding uh, platform. And, you know, we're looking to expand that. We're going to be applying some uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, aspect to this to help further help people refine their diet and their health. And so that's that's the next phase that we're looking at, you know, delving into right now. So uh, we're expanding uh, pretty rapidly and we'll continue to do so, you know, for the foreseeable future. So you would say basically uh, that uh, since in India, we have a beef ban, uh, cows are holy, considered holy in India. So we have a strict beef ban. So Indians who want to try out carnivore diet can pretty well pull it off just by consuming mutton, chicken and fish and the other meat, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to get some of the ruminant meat in there. And I think that is, you know, sort of consistent with our evolutionary history. And so I think ideally, you know, a chicken and egg only diet would, would be a little bit deficient. So I think as long as you can get some form of red meat, uh, obviously things like goat or lamb or mutton would be probably the easiest source. I, I understand maybe water buffalo might be an option for some people, you know, 
uh, in some cases. So that that's you know, and I and I understand it. In some places in India, you might be able to even even able to eat beef. I think I'm not. I mean, I'm not 100 sure, and you guys are no better than me. But but anyway, but nonetheless, you can certainly do that based on you know chicken, lamb, seafood, eggs, things like that. You know, and, and I guess is pork something that's, that's popular in India or not? I mean, it seems like in parts of lots of not, Asia. It's not really popular per se, but yeah, it's consumed. It it is consumed. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you can definitely do it. And then there are people that do it. I'm, you guys are probably the fourth or fifth time I've done interviews with, with folks in India and, and a lot of them, a lot of them are doing it. So it's, 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 it's definitely doable. It may be harder than it is for me, but it's definitely something you can do. And uh, um, I think, you know, just trying it for a month or two, you can see a huge difference in many, many cases. And once you see that, unfortunately, once you see it and you feel so good, it's hard to go back <laughs> and, and start to, to go back to, the, to the, the, the typical way of eating. Just wanted to ask, uh, I mean, is this all kind of a placebo effect that's running in everyone's mind? Like, uh, are these advantages or these uh, benefits actually happening? Or, I mean, is this like a community thing and, you know, the placebo effect is hitting on me? Like, you know, it's actually good, like a week or two, oh, it's actually feeling good. I mean, is that actually happening or is it just a placebo, placebo effect? Well, I mean, you certainly can't discount placebo effect. And, you know, there's a, this concept of I feel like I'm doing the right thing and therefore I'm going to get better because that does occur. However, you know, what I what I see is, is quite a bit of objective evidence. I see, you know, uh, medical imaging studies, you know, with people that have things like uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome where you can see the cysts on the ovary and they get a subsequent scan and the cysts have gone. We see people that are on medications that no longer come on medication. We see people lose weight all the time. That's pretty clear. You know, somebody starts out 50 kilos overweight and they lose 50 kilos. That's not a placebo effect that actually occurred. I see changes in lab values all the time. I see changes in disease states occurring, you know, that are medically documented. This is occurring all the time. So that, I wouldn't consider that placebo. Uh, you know, I do think that having the right attitude, if you go into this thinking it's not going to work and it's stupid and I think you're less likely to be successful. So there is some aspect of, you know, actually having faith in what you're doing is going to be helpful. You know, that, that, that occurs in any situation, whether you're having a medical procedure or not, if you go into a medical procedure saying, this is a stupid procedure and I think it's going to not work, you're probably going to have less likely to have a good outcome, even though the surgeon does the exact same thing as he does to the other person. So you can't discount the mental aspect of it, but I, I see objective evidence every single day. In fact, I've collected, gosh, thousands of these now and some of our testimonials will have, you know, these are my labs before, these are labs after, lab changes are not necessarily placebo effects. Uh, uh, just another small question uh, with regard to the fact that you told us, yeah, and you know, uh, it's uh, not that easy for us to pull, it, pull uh, a carnivore diet off in India. I just wanted to know, I mean, if, I mean, first of all, do you eat all the organ meats? Uh, are you kind of a nose to tail person? And uh, if so, I mean, uh, if not, or if yes, I mean, do you recommend uh, people who are starting off in the carnivore diet to, you know, actually focus on the entire organ and no, and be a nose to tail guy? I mean, so I, you know, this is a great question. And what I like to do is I tend to, I've always focused on results. I look at what people are actually doing and what's actually happening to them. And there's other people that tend to talk about theoretical concerns. And so certainly including organs and in diet will allow you to more likely get more nutrients towards something like the RDA, the USRDA, recommended daily allowances, that, that's clear. We do know that organs are higher in certain nutrients than, than other parts of the animal. Um, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with eating organ meats. I think if you like them, if you have access to them, if they're cheap, and in, in many cases, they're, they're very inexpensive, great source of food. Um, many people find them profoundly distasteful. I mean, I don't particularly care for them. I don't really eat them personally. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I've tried it. I've tried my best. I've eaten it from, I've had like very high level chefs prepare it for me. And I'm like, it still doesn't do much for me. You know, it's, 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 so I, I, and what I've done when I, when I surveyed over 10,000 people doing this diet and I got the data back and I asked them specifically, how much organ meats do you eat? Do you eat it, you know, very frequently, at least once a week, you know, once a month or, or rarely or never. 
only 15%, 1-5%, a small percentage actually ate organ meats with any regularity. The outcomes and that whole group were no different. There was no difference between the people that ate organs and the people that didn't. Generally, when it, took, when it came to coming off medications, losing weight, reversing signs of disease, you know, all the symptomatic stuff. So I can't say that it's an absolute requirement. There's other people within the carnivore community that you've got to eat nose to tail, and if you don't, you're going to get some nutrient deficiencies. I will tell you, the people that have been doing this diet the longest, the people who have been doing it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, almost all of them do not eat organ meats. They just eat ground, you know, ground meat, you know, they'll eat steaks, they'll eat hamburgers, they'll eat eggs and that, that sort of stuff. And so I am sort of, again, I'm not going to say that they don't have a role or a benefit. And I think, you know, for, and there's certainly people out there that I've seen that they say, I feel better when I eat liver. Great. I think you should do it then. I, I don't, I tell people do what's going to work for you. And I think that's my uh, that's been my sort of overlying or, or guiding principle is do something that's going to work for you personally. Don't listen to what I have to say or anybody else has to say. Be dogmatic about finding your own level of health. And so I think the other thing I was going to say with, you know, even if you could not pull off a full carnivore diet in India, getting rid of refined grains, you know, the junk food, the, the convenience food, the processed food, the sugars. And, and likely the oils, you know, these cooking oils, go back to ghee, go back to, you know, animal fat, you know, or, you know, butter or, you know, whatever you, whatever your grandparents cooked with, because India is not going in a good direction. As you guys know, I mean, you're seeing more and more obesity, you're seeing more and more heart disease, you're seeing more and more diabetes, you're, you're seeing infertility and mental health issues. You know, those things are problematic and they aren't going to get better in nutrition has a huge part of that. So at the very least, roll back what you ate 50 years to 50 years before. And then you're likely to be, <laughs> you're still likely to be better off, you know, regardless of whether you go animal based or not. Uh, wanted to just add one more question uh, on to what you just said. Uh, like you said, uh, the people who've been eating 15 years, 20 years for uh, on this, uh, who've been on this carnivore diet, uh, there are people who actually say that, you know, effects don't actually uh, are not clear if because you know we can't really tell uh, how a carnivore diet is going to affect a person because uh, no one has you know had it for like 50 years because you know have you have your carnivore diet and come back after 50 years when you are almost going to have cancer or something like that i mean what do you have to tell about uh, to those people well, I think that's more of a, that's almost a religious argument that, that, that to me is, is kind of almost a non nonsensical argument. You know, it's to say that I can tell you what diet's going to make you live to be a hundred years of age is no one knows that no one really, and our nutritional science does not know that there are no long-term randomized controlled trial studies on any diet without any kind of serious, with any kind of clinical outcome. So to say that you're going to get cancer or you're going to die of heart disease in 50 years because of your dietary choices there is no data out there that would support that one way or the other. I don't know if a carnivore diet is going to make me live longer or shorter. Quite honestly, I don't really care. I mean, I'd, obviously, I'd like to live longer. But more importantly, I want to know what my health is like today. This Because, I, I, you know, tomorrow I may get hit by lightning or a bus may run me over. And if I have a poor quality of life, you know, my whole life, because I think I'm going to avoid a heart attack at 70, what is a point? I mean, what is, what is the purpose of that? So I think, I think what we can, I think, honestly, if we're honest about this, I don't think we can realistically say what someone's going to die of based on their diet. Now you could say someone who's obese and smoking and is in bad shape, you're likely going to die early. I mean, that's pretty fair to say. I mean, if you're in poor health today, very likely, if you don't change something, your health is going to get worse over time. What I think you can do with diet is you can say, look, I am overweight, I am diabetic, I am depressed. If I change my diet and all of those things get better, that's as good as you can get. And I think that's what we should focus on. If we just focus on that, you know, from a society, from a healthcare, you know, the, the healthcare industry, we'll have served the people much better than saying, oh, we're going to pretend, we're going to make you live to 120 and you're not going to have heart disease. Because no one, no one knows that. And all these people, these sort of longevity gurus that tell you to, 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 to take my magic powders, 
they don't give you a money back guarantee when you die at 72 instead of 77 because they have no way of knowing that there's no there are no people walking around at 120 years of age that are super healthy that have a lot of muscle and well there's nobody walking around at 120 there's none zero people so for people that are telling you i know how to make you live longer based on you know eating the magic berries and you know it's just all garbage so i would say focus on today and tomorrow get as healthy as you can and just continue doing those things you know and and, and then that's the best you can do and uh, so i mean let me just get this straight so if someone is to come and ask dr sean baker you know what is the best diet as per you what would he just say well i mean i would say that you know ultimately the best diet for you is going to be the one that makes you feel perform uh, and, and, and be your best. I mean, and, and, and that starts tomorrow. Um, I would say that, uh, in my opinion, that diet probably includes animal products. I mean, I think that's fair to say. And I think that's pretty clear that uh, animal products are, you know, I think, you know, an animal based diet that does not include junk food is a extremely, extremely healthy diet. I think when you have junk food in any diet, you know, whatever else you put in there is not going to do as well as it should have. So that is to say, if you're eating a chronic junk food diet, then maybe the meat can cause, can cause problems because you've already, you've already compromised your system so that it doesn't process the food you're designed to be processing naturally or normally. And so, uh, but ultimately yeah, you've got to, you've got to pick a diet that makes you feel good. If your diet makes you constantly have stomach pains and gas and bloating and you know, you're tired all the time, it's not the right diet for you. You know, go change gears, go, go do something different. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's find uh, the one question that I wanted to ask you finally is Evan here wanted to try out uh, the carnivore diet or the meat only diet. So uh, what is your advice for him? And what are the things that he might uh, problems that he might face over the few months? So what I would say is, you know, certainly if you want to use a MeetRx resource, we've got plenty of free resources. So that's a great place to get information. We have FAQs and all kinds of videos that you can look at and all kinds of articles you can read. So that's just general advice to get going. I think the biggest error a lot of people make is, you know, one of the problems is when you start reducing carbohydrates, you may have a lot of cravings for that. And I think the best way to do that is to ensure you're eating enough. So, so many people under eat, they may even be full because they eat some meat and they're like, well, I'm kind of full, but then they get these cravings. So you have to eat enough. You might have to eat more than you think. You might have to eat past satiety initially to prevent those cravings. And, I, and people ask me, how much do I eat? Well, I say eat enough so that you don't want, you know, chocolate or candies or, you know, or, you know, cakes or pastries or eat enough meat so that you don't want those other foods that normally would sort of just derail your diet. So you have to eat enough. Um, you're, you might have to increase uh, electrolyte consumption salts within in fluid because sometimes you can be dehydrated. Um, you're going to find that your bowel habits change. You're not going to go to the bathroom as much. You're not going to have as many bowel movements because you are no longer producing as much waste. You know, if you look at a grazing cow, they're constantly eating and stuff's constantly coming out the back end. When you stop grazing on all the fiber, there's not as much material to get rid of. And so you just absorb everything. And so you might not even have a bowel movement for several days. That is normal. That is to be expected. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, eating and electrolytes are probably the biggest things. Um, getting support uh, it can be helpful because, you know, a lot you'll have questions and you, you may not have anybody to turn to. And that's, again, this is why these online platforms are so, so helpful. Um, again, I don't know what's locally available in India. I don't know if there's much. I know, like I said, I know I, I, I'm aware of 10 guys in India on the carnivore diet, but 10 guys out of 1 billion is, you know, it's pretty unlikely you're going to run into each other. Um, so, I mean, again, that's why one of the reasons we offer our platform, uh, that's important. Um, enjoy what you eat. Don't make it so that it is a, you know, a, a sense of boredom. If you need to use spices, you need to use a little dairy in there, do that to make it more palatable so that you can enjoy it. You don't want to sit down there and, and dread your meal. You want to look forward to it. So you want to make it as much fun and as decadent as possible. Use different combinations of flavors and different types of meats and, you know, eggs and cheeses and, you know, those types of things, yogurts and, you know, the, you know, if you're going to do mutton or you're going to do, you know, fish, 
just, and, and if you've got one, India is a culture of wonderful spices. I mean, you guys just have just tremendous, you know, aromas and flavors. And so you can use some of those just to make, make it palatable, you know, and then at some point, some people might have to, you know, remove some of those if, if they're, if they're causing gastrointestinal problems, but in general, you know, if you're going to make it, if you're going to make a curry or something like that, you know, you can use a curry, you can use chicken and you can use some dairy and make it, you know, you just, you might have to learn, you, you know, become a good cook. You know, you have to learn how to prepare your own food. Don't buy the prepackaged, pre-processed food from the store. It's got garbage in it. So you want to, you want to just try to make, you get, get handy around the kitchen. You know, you, that's a skill you should have anyway. You know, you should know how to cook. If if you're an, if you're an adult human, you should know how to feed yourself, right? You shouldn't rely on some store, store store-bought garbage to, 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 to provide your nutrition.